All right. Please be joined at this time by Dr. Joseph Mullins. Dr. Mullins is faculty athletic rep uh, for Reinhardt University and also um, is the program coordinator for their sports studies program, which is the undergrad program and the, uh, for the master's or um, graduate program is sports administration and leadership. So really, and, and, Co and Dr. Mullins has also been Coach Mullins, uh, has helped with football and wrestling and all that. So I kind of took your time, I guess, to tell your biography, Coach, but I want people to see when, um, when they're watching this one, kind of what the perspective is, because I'm excited about this because it's a little different perspective than just getting the, the um, college coach in here to tell us what we're doing. So first off, thanks for joining me. Uh, excited to do this one. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, so tell it, I, I, I gave it away a little bit, but the first question is always, tell them a little bit about what you're doing, how you got to where you are, uh, your background in sports, and kind of what you, what you do at Reinhardt. Yeah, so this is finishing up my eighth year at Reinhardt. Uh, I started in the fall of 2012. Prior to being at Reinhardt, I was uh, was up there with you guys at Pickens, and it was a tough, it was a a real tough decision to to come to Reinhardt. And I was ready to go, and then you showed up, and you know, yeah, teaching to talk you out of it. That st stellar <laughs> PE job we were teaching there. Yeah, uh, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I want to go or not. You know, and it's ultimately been the right decision, and because I've got to stay involved up there at Pickens, which I it is close to my heart. I love those programs up there. But, you know, since being there, my, my role at Reinhardt has changed a lot. I mean, when I first got there, all I did was teach. I taught and I went home. Now it's gone to about 50% teaching, about 50% administration. And then for about the last five years, I've gotten involved in the athletic role as FAR. And, you know, that's a role that every, every university has to have. Georgia, Alabama, they all have one. And it's just essentially the – the academic side putting a check mark on that these these athletes are eligible, you know, and, and it's a serious deal and, you know, you don't want somebody to be ineligible. It just looks bad. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm still volunteering, helping you guys up there and enjoying that. Yeah. And, and uh, Dr. Mullins is a personal friend of mine. And uh, so, but I was really excited to have him on here because uh, there's a real unique perspective you have on coaching high school, multiple sports, uh, been the head wrestling coach, and uh, being a teacher at the college, but also being close to the college athletics. I know you're close to the wrestling program up there. You're close to all the programs up there. Work closely with the head coaches of all sports to get these guys in. So, you know, it's just a really, you know, you're not talking to some, so people listening to this from now on, you can kind of, vouch for it that, that you're not talking to somebody who only knows about academics and is here to bore you with that, but you're also not talking to somebody who doesn't know the realities of the situation and kind of what, and, and so I want you to think too, while you're thinking Dr. Mullins, what talk, talk a little bit too when you can about uh, just what NAIA kind of offers and how it's different maybe than the NCAA and whatever. So we put up these five steps and we've done this with several people uh, and, and obviously you can talk about all five of them, I know, but they're in order. They're steps. They're not just five bullet points. You have to have number one to go to number two, and you have to have number two to go to number three, and so on. And, you know, I've been preaching in this course that 95% uh, of the people get stopped on one or two. You know, they either have one of those two things or neither, but very few people have both. Uh, tell us a little bit about the grades and – um how as, as you guys enter as they enter Reinhardt and then we can talk a little bit about what happens once they get there but this is all right now we're talking about you know getting being eligible to play at Reinhardt what what all type of things would they have to do yeah so you know the, the way I look at grades and this I look at it maybe a little bit different than some other people is you know we have minimum requirements like everybody else the NAI has minimum requirements and I I actually screenshotted them on my phone because I figured you were going to ask me this question. I ought to be able to do them right off the top of my head, but you know, they're going to fire <laughs> you me. You told on yourself. Thing. Nobody would have known if you just read them all. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be honest. Words, although that's, that's up in the air right now with this the, the whole COVID 19 deal. But um, essentially, we, we look at three different things, and NAIA looks at all of these different, three incoming freshmen. You've got to have an ACT or an SAT score. Um, 
you've got to have a GPA and you've got to uh, finish in the top half of your class. So two of these three you have to meet in order to be eligible. Right. So as far as, as SAT, you've got to have a 970 or higher. Okay, GPA, you've got to have a 2.0 or higher. And then you've got to finish in the top 50% of your class. Two of those three you have to meet to be eligible your first year. And, and we don't determine that. It, they have a clearinghouse just like the NCAA does. So you submit all that stuff. They tell you whether you're eligible or not. Where I th think that out for parents and for players is the higher, I, the better my grades are, the more money I'm going to get at the NAIA level. And that's the probably the thing I don't think people really get is that probably 70% of NAIA schools stack scholarships. So you can come in and get academic money and athletic money and combine those towards your tuition. And, and most universities do that academic money on a, like a sliding scale. The better you are academically, the higher you're going to get and the more money you're going to get. And so I try to tell, you know, players and parents, look, we're not trying to just get into school. We're trying to, to get as much money as we can so we come out with as little debt as possible. Right. And, and that's kind of where with this particular talk, I, I want to skip from one to five because not that I know, you know, a lot about two, three and four, but since you're not the one that picks who to offer, we'll skip those. But when we get to flexibility, that's what you're talking about. Cause I don't think a lot of people realize that number one through four is determined by the college. Does Reinhardt, do you meet Reinhardt's grades? Do you meet Reinhardt's ability? Do you have the character they're looking for, the work ethic? But then when you get to five, Reinhardt offers you a scholarship. Are you going to take it? Well, if that scholarship is only going to give you maybe 10% of what it costs to go to school there, you may not have the money for that. And what I'm learning uh, in this process and what I learned from 20 years in athletics is parents and kids both, but especially parents, are very ignorant of the process until right here. It's like they get to number five. And they think we check these boxes and then they, they don't realize that it's going to cost them $25,000 or it's going to cost because they barely got in. So you guys can't really give them much because most of the money is academic. Or I don't know if most is the right word, but a lot of the money you all can offer, not just at Reinhardt, but at all schools below the big time schools, that's what you're going to get. Is that, I mean, I don't know if there's a question there, but, is that, is that, you can attest, is that a true statement? I mean, you can get, I mean, you know, it's, it's the academic money is money that's, I don't want to say it's free money, but if you do what you're supposed to do, no matter your level of ability, that money's there. That athletic money, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's very much like the, you know, like the NCAA level. I mean, NAI has a limit of, you know, full rides that a school can offer, you know, and, and nobody's getting a full ride, but that, you know, there's only so much money out there athletically to give. Mm -hmm. They're going to give it to the, the people that are the players, but they need well, to. Can you tell them, like, for a football team, how many, how many full scholarships they have on the football team? All right, so the most you can give out is 24. And they got about, what, how many people on the team? Oh, 130. Over 100. Yeah, over yeah. 100. Yeah, so, so everybody's getting a part of it, right? Right, right. You, you know, you're taking that twenty. You know, if, you, if it's thirty thousand dollars to go to school, you're taking that twenty-four times thirty thousand dollars, and that's the amount of money that coach can use to bring in those hundred players. So he's got to decide how he's going to break that money up to to make sure he meets his numbers recruiting wise and still gets the players. And so you don't know what piece of that you know pie you're getting. You know, if you've got good grades, you know, hey, I'm getting you know, $10,000 for my academic money. And then if coach gives me, you know, some, some academic or some athletic money, and then I have hope or G tag, all that kind of stuff, you can start knocking the price tag down a lot. Well, and do, so, so people understand that not to beat a dead horse here, but I want to make this crystal clear to somebody listening. Uh, there are people out there that Reinhardt gave say $8,000 to player A and gave $5,000 to player B, but player B may be paying less money to go to Reinhardt because 
he has way more academic money. Absolutely. And, and, and I, I know that makes common sense to me and you because we've been doing this for 20 years. But I don't think that parents always understand that. They're going to give you. They're going to stack you athletically in, in a certain rank, and you just heard him say twenty four scholarships for a hundred people. I don't know that hardly any of them get the full scholarship. I don't know that anybody does, to be honest. Uh, so everybody's on a partial scholarship. Uh, those can be as low as just a little tiny bit of money, you know, up to uh, as much as they can give you, I guess. But with a hundred guys in twenty four spots, you can figure out that that's on average a fourth of a scholarship. So you know, most of your money still is going to come from if, and, it, and we're talking to people all across the country here, but in Georgia, it'd be hope, uh, it'd be academic money the school can offer you. Um, and at a lot of times, these smaller schools, especially like at Division three level and even the AI level, they're private schools a lot of times, which are going to make the cost be even higher. And so I just think parents get to this step five and they want to play college ball. Their kid was the best wrestler in the whole region or whatever it was and then they realize they only got these three options and wrestling is actually a great analogy of this because you may only have you may be the best wrestler in the region and only have these three options and one of them's in kansas and one of them's in minnesota and one of them's at reinhardt and reinhardt's close and that sounds good but in all three cases you look out there and you're paying a pretty significant amount of money especially if your grades weren't good yeah and, and so you know I know I'm preaching at the choir on that, but I hope this is helpful to people. And we brought you on specifically to verify this stuff that, to be honest, we've been saying without you. But you have that role where this is for real what it is. Like, what would happen if uh, Coach Miller, or, you know, in this case, Coach Miller, but whoever, try, that somebody's trying to get in and they don't meet those requirements. How would, would you be the one that would figure that out first or the registrar or how would we get? You know, what should happen doesn't always happen, but what should happen from a recruiting standpoint is, you know, the, the, the coach has got to know those requirements and, and see that ahead of time and, and be able to say, let me see your GPA, let me see your transcripts. And, you know, they should know, okay, yeah, it's not going to happen. Now, you know, the, uh, some schools will, I mean, the problem is, is that that initial, that initial eligibility, the school has nothing to do with. Right. It's a hundred percent done by the clearinghouse. And it, it is frustrating because you have to submit that stuff and wait, you know, and, and they're basically going off those three criteria. You know, do you meet the test score? Do you, do you meet GPA or do you meet the, the uh, top 50% of your class? If you meet two out of those three, you're eligible. And, and it's once it's declared from then on, your eligibility is decided by the school. After you're the first time, I determine the eligibility. I got you. And, uh, and it's a different set of. So talk, uh, so well, first off, do you guys have kids occasionally that are down to the last minute on that, getting through the clearinghouse and it's a stressful moment and I don't want you to tell any specific stories, but I want people to know their bad grades can put them in a spot where they're in June or July and they don't know what they're about to do, right? They're taking this test for the last time. That's a stressful place to be in. So if you're a kid right now, if you're watching this, you're a parent, you're a kid, you're in the 10th grade, go get a 970 so you can at least check that off. You know, have a 2.0, that's, Lord have mercy, that's not asking too much. You know, because, I, I mean, you can attest, you guys, have, I know, I don't want you to tell the stories because I don't want to give anything away on that. But I know y'all have some sad stories of people not making it at the last minute. And it really alters their life, correct? Yeah, it, two ways. One, I mean, we've seen kids that can't get in, um, you know, which is it's frustrating. And then we see kids that are that have the ability to get in but they don't do their, you know, they get accepted into school, but they don't do their due diligence of sending their stuff into the clearinghouse. And so they're playing the first game and they're having to sit on the bench because they didn't do their job to get their stuff sent in on time. And they, you know, you're, you're one of hundreds of thousands of people that they're trying to check off at the NAIA to say you're eligible. 
you're not getting you know special treatment and, and i've had to sit there and have that conversation and tell kids look hey it's, we're supposed to play a football game on saturday and it's wednesday and you you're still not through play any eye at the clearinghouse and You wouldn't have to tell a kid it's just work his rear end off for, you know, all those two a day practices and all that mess that's going on. But that's on them. That's that's nobody else can do that for them but them. I think that one of the lessons we're trying to teach in this is that a lot of this is on you. You know, quit trying to put it on somebody else. Look in the mirror, say these are the things I can control. I'm going to worry about this. Uh, if you're not through the clearinghouse, which I believe they can start setting stuff up through the clearinghouse if now, if they're a senior, right, or a junior. Absolutely. I mean, you, yeah, you don't have to wait till the end to do that. Yeah, the counselor can send that stuff for them straight to NAI. Yeah. I mean, so that's just something that you're be, you're just – either you're ignorant of the process or you're being lazy if you're not getting that stuff done. And so that's why this this is not my favorite topic that we talk about, but I feel like it is – has the potential to be the most influential and the most helpful to somebody. Um, so let's talk a minute, which we haven't done in some of the other talks I've done like this, but let's talk a minute about player X. They get in school. Now they're in school. They went through the clearinghouse. They got a scholarship package academically and athletically. Y'all put it together. They paid their tuition, whatever. What is your relationship with that kid now for the next four or five years? Um, so it depends, it kind of depends if, if obviously if they're one of our majors, I'm going to have a real good relationship with them. I'm going to know everything that there is to know about that kid. If they're not, the relationship's going to be that we're going to do their eligibility. If it's a one semester sport like football, that eligibility is going to get ran once a year, you know, right before the season starts. If it's a two, two semester the second semester so basketball gets ran in October and in December you know usually what my relationship ends up being is that you know what's going to happen here in just a few weeks is that kids are not going to pass some classes and they're going to need help with summer classes and where to take those as transient students and um, trying to figure out if do they have enough hours you know, are they eligible? Because we determine that, which is kind of nice because it's, it's set in stone. You know, we tell them the, uh, tell them how you get out, you know, if you're already a current student, how you would become ineligible. Well, so kind of the, the rule of thumb is this, it's, it's, it's numbers. It's 12, 24, 48, 72. And that sounds like a bunch of crazy stuff. But essentially is this, you've got to always be in 12 hours you ever drop below 12 hours you're ineligible right then um, going into your sophomore year you have to have passed 24 hours in the previous two semesters going into your um, junior year you have to pass 48 total and going into your senior year you have to pass 72 total and so it's just a numbers game and, and really the easiest way to explain it to a parent or a kid is just look you always got to pass 12 hours every semester. Mm -hmm. Now that's not going to make you graduate on time to be eligible to finish in four years, but to be eligible, if you, if you pass 12 every single time, you're going to, you know, you're going to always be eligible. And there's no reason somebody shouldn't do that. Again, it kind of falls into yeah. some of that's not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And because I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but I think some people that are have current ninth and tenth grade kids and are watching this, you know, twelve hours is four classes essentially. You know, usually you're gonna take about five classes, right? I'd say on average they're gonna take about five. Um, uh, we talked about what you do with something with recruiting that's unique. Uh, even in the eight years you've done this, has how has how has recruiting changed or how has maybe even academic admissions changed in the last eight years? Recruiting has changed a lot. You know, I just literally spent probably four or five hours this week helping the wrestling coach put together an Adobe Spark page to send out the recruits because they can't come on campus. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that's changed is, is everything trickles down. And, you know, it used to be four or five years ago, you know, if somebody was going on, you know, going to Alabama as a recruiting trip, you know, they get a picture made in a jersey and 
they might create a you know a graphic of them when they sign their scholarship. Well, now everybody expects that. It's become very much a um, like a social kind of cultural thing. Like kids want to announce their decision where they're going. They want to have that graphic of them in the jersey, and so it's putting pressure even on small schools. To I mean, one, and once one person started doing it, then every school's doing it, and so it, to me, it's 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 changed more of, it, it's a much more social event. Man. I mean, it, it's a status thing for kids. They, they want to say, hey, I'm considering this school or this school. This is what my pick is. They want to, you know, do the Instagram thing and put that stuff out there. And coaches, they may not like it, but you, you, you better do it if you want to be competitive and be able to have a chance to get those kids. To me, they, that's the biggest change, that and just the the – being able to monitor kids online, see what they're doing in social media, being able to gauge some of that um, that character stuff well before you ever have a conversation with that kid, that stuff's changed a lot and it's gonna continue to evolve. You know, one of the things that uh, gets brought up when we talk to coaches about this, particularly football. Now I like this, I would hope that this topic is for all sports, but particularly with football, it's kind of one of the last sports where the, the college coach has to go talk to the high school coach. There's no AAU or travel team or whatever. But there's but I hear from the football coaches that the, the way the social media has gone and the way that the kids expect graphics and all that, the college coach now a lot of times reaches out straight to the recruit. You know, it's actually – there's a lot less emphasis – on the coach in general, the high school coach, less than there's ever been in all sports. But football was kind of one even recently that you didn't – that wasn't true, and, and it kind of is changing as we speak. Do you think that has a – do you think the negative impact of that – there's a lot of positives to that. I'm not trying to take away from that. But do you think the negative impact of that could be the character and some of the work ethic, some of the stuff that you would only learn from talking to that coach? I think some people are missing out on that. They're solely going off of ability, checking their transcript, getting them in, talking to them directly quicker. And I think you all maybe sometimes don't know who you're getting to their own campus. Is that fair to say? Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I don't know how much our coaches are reaching straight out to, to kids via social media to do that versus talking to coaches. I think they're missing the boat on that stuff. I mean, if, if I'm going to go, I mean, as bad as I, it's not making a business, but it is a business to a certain extent. If I'm going to go spend money on a kid, I want to know what I'm getting, especially if I'm going to pay, pay a lot of money, you know, relative to what we do. I, I, the only person who's really going to be able to tell me that is his coach. You know, he's going to be able to tell me. I think people do not understand, even at the NAI level, it's a different planet competitively than what high school is. Oh, absolutely. And there, and there are a lot of kids that just, that are good high school kids that just cannot hack it. They cannot, they can't handle practicing, the play in that pace. And a high school coach who's been around it a long time and has probably played college ball, been around college ball, they're going to be able to say, yeah, this kid's going to be able to do it. And you just can't get that off Twitter. And I don't think that – Reinhardt never did that for us, by the way. Reinhardt's been great. They're close to us and all that. But I do think some of your competitors – because Reinhardt's been pretty good. If you're if you're watching okay. this and you're not sure who we're talking to, you need to look up Reinhardt's football record in the last five or six years. You know, Reinhardt's been really good. But some of the teams that haven't been real good, they're going to try to jump in and immediately get personal with that. And look, I don't blame them. They're trying to compete. I'm not knocking that. What I'm saying is the only per that parent is never, the parent's going to see it through love glasses, right? The, uh, you know, the kid, the kid is going to see uh, themselves through love glasses. A lot of times the coach is the only person who has to kind of be honest with you because not only is I mean, don't get me wrong. I think coaches want their kids. They, they kind of push their kids. But they have to push the kids in the future, too. So there's an obligation to be honest to the college coach. And I do think that piece of it's been missing in baseball and basketball and some other sports for a while. And it's going to be missing in football if they don't 
watch out because uh, what I like to talk about, and we don't really have all day to do it now, but I would love to talk to you sometime about how you guys can mold a kid once he's on campus. Cause that to me is a, that's what separates these guys. Getting that, getting to put a hat on and say you're going to school wherever it's great, but that's the beginning of the hard work, you know, and what are the traits and, and you can answer this quick if you got time, but I'd be curious to study what are the traits that you see over an extended period of time for somebody that makes it versus doesn't. Because, I mean, obviously y'all aren't recruiting kids not to make it, so y'all think they're all going to make it when they get there. What separates them from the ones that are still playing two and three and four years later? What comes to mind when I ask that question? You know, I, I think it's the, the gritty kids. The ones that have grit, not just not just athletic grit, but they're just able to deal with things not going their way because it's going to happen constantly. You know, you're going to get hurt. You're going to lose your spot. You're going to be in a class. You can't get away from them, and they're just you know you're going to fail a class. I mean, something nothing's going to go perfect the whole four years, and I think. Some kids have been sheltered their whole life and they've never had to deal with disappointment, with things not going their way, you know, and, and they just crumble. They just cannot handle it. And I think that's a, to me, that's a, a thing that can, the good coaches in high school teach. Like they give those kids a chance to fail and it's okay to, to screw this up now and figure it out. And so to me, that's a, you know, way before athletic ability or anything like that, it's just kind of that just, Grit, you know. Um, I mean, I'll pick a you know, kid that you're gonna know, Kobe Milner. I mean, you know, the kid just wrestled four matches at the national tournament on a broke ankle to all America. You know, I mean, you don't Good. not a whole lot of kids wired like that. You just gotta want to do that and want to deal with that kind of deal. I think that's a and that's a trait we can start teaching kids young. I mean, well, young, and- our, our kids are. Since you brought him up, I'm going to use his name again. Uh, Kobe Milner is a wrestler on Reinhardt's wrestling team. Google him if you're hearing this and want to know more. Kobe won the state championship three times in a row, correct, in high school. He was a state champion three times in a row. Uh, I was the AD. I'm sure I had a lot to do with that. Um, (laughs) But uh, he wins the state championship three times in a row. Best person in the state three times in a row. If you equated that to be an all-state in football three years in a row, or all, you know, I mean, if you try to equate it to what's comparable, where does Kobe end up? He goes and wrestles at Rodman. That's who you're. That's the athletes at the NAI school. You know, it's not. I think one of the other things I pitch with this when we get the college coaches in is, it's not really like you go to Georgia and then if you're not good enough to play at Georgia, I guess you can go to Reinhardt. It's not like that. These players that need all these sports are exceptionally talented. You know, so if you go wrestle Reinhardt, you're wrestling this three-time state champion. You're not getting the guy that was kind of decent on his high school team and still thinks he can play. And I hope I'm not insulting anybody listening, but you got to be good. You got to be good. You got to have some ability. Like you said earlier, people don't understand how good the, the quality of play is in that league, Reinhardt's in the whole league, not just Reinhardt, the whole league. Um, and so I think that's something we get in this. I think well, talk about next from each perspective here. And, and I like your um, your perspective on this because it is a little different than other guys we've talked to. You're talking to a parent. This parent's in high school. We're not talking about a person at your school now. What can they do to help their kid? Um, a couple of things. The first thing is, um, and I, I'll just put it out there. Sometimes they got to swallow their pride a little bit and they've got to realize at what level their, their child can play at. I mean, everybody wants to play at Alabama or Georgia. I mean, look, it's what you grow up. So, you know, I don't personally know anybody that's played at those schools. <laughs> so I, I you know, you, you got to, 
as a parent, you got to see, you got to be willing to expose your kid to every level that's available to them to play at, whether it be Division Two, II, Division Three, NAIA, and a lot of times at those lower levels, you can have a lot more access to the coach to get in front of them. I know at the NAIA level, they have a lot of, uh, you know, like uh, open gym type uh, deals where you can get in front of coaches and, mm -hmm. and you're not trying to be at a camp with 500 kids that you're trying to compete against. And so if you really, if the goal is to get them a scholarship, then and understand what level they're able to play at, help them get their grades up, and then figure out where you feel comfortable. I think that's where people miss the boat is you've got to recruit the school as much as they're recruiting you. Like, you mean? you're going to spend four years there. I mean, you may get hurt. You may – the coach may leave. You may lose your spot. you got to figure out, am I going to be able to survive here four years and enjoy it outside of athletics? And that takes visiting places and meeting coaches and taking trips. And point when they get to the school, like they just know, hey, I feel comfortable here. I really, you know, they they have what I need. They have my major, you know, they have services I might need. They, I like the coach, you know, and you just know it's the right fit. So a lot of it's just being honest about, you know, what's available to them and where they can really compete. Yeah, I think the fit is so um, important. And, they, and it's the parents are just as bad as the kids on this. They really struggle to separate the fit from what looks cooler or what's the higher level. And um, I, I'm not going to tell any specific stories, but just kids going to maybe a, a, a school one division higher that couldn't beat that other school in, in a sport, to be honest. It's just that it's one division higher but it's way off and it's not a good fit. And you got to think it, you know, the goal is to end there. You know, the goal is to end at that place and graduate. So if you're not doing that, you know, what's going to get you to there, start with the end in mind and work back would be my advice for a parent on that. And of course the parents should worry about what they can control and not what they can. Cause we also have parents listen to this that Reinhardt doesn't want. Them. I mean, they're just not good enough to play at Reinhardt. It sucks but they're just not good enough to play at Reinhardt. They don't control that. They do control if they are good enough and can't get in because they don't have the GPA. Yes. Or if they didn't come to the camp or if they didn't, you know, so check all the boxes. So you did your part, then put it on them to do their part. And if they don't, you did everything you could, you know? Um, what about high school players? What, what advice do you have for them? I mean, to start with grades, to control the things you can control. You can control your grades. You can control um, the effort you put in and, and in the weight room. You can control uh, your social media and, you know, the brand you put out there. Control. Look at options. Like, you know, start thinking about really what's important to you outside of just playing. So, I mean, what do you want to major in? You know, do you want to be in a classroom with 200 people versus a classroom with 20 people? Um, do you want a place where your folks can come watch you play and travel with you? And, and you have to think about the, the big picture. This is something I think kids miss a lot of times is that, you know, let's, let's say I walk into a school as a freshman and coach says, well, I'm going to redshirt you. Well, some people will get their feelings hurt. Well, why am I getting registered? Well, that's a good thing because that's a year you get to grow. That's a year that you get to concentrate on school. And if you do what you're supposed to on the back end of the master's degree paid for and come out of there with two degrees versus one. And I mean, I, I should start doing this, but I don't. I wish I would take a picture of kids when they walk in as a freshman and when they walk out as a senior because they will not believe how much they've changed. Mm -hmm just develop physically and they just look different. So you don't know what, you don't know what you're going to turn into in four years of being in the weight room and playing against better competition. And, and so from a, a player standpoint, control what you can control and, and explore all your options. Look at everywhere that's available to you to play and you'll know when it's right. All right.
No, I, I agree. Um, I, I think, too, if you're an athlete watching this, rewind and watch the first about 15 minutes because um, so many of them I saw along the way, Coach, um, they got stopped because they didn't understand it was going to cost X amount of money and I was going to have to move to Minnesota or whatever it was, Michigan, Wisconsin, Oregon, you know, and I, you only have the options you have. And these may be your options. It may cost money. You need to get academic money. You need to get your hope in order, whatever it is. Cause I just feel like everything you said was spot on. And I feel like some kids though, they don't even get those off. They only got the one option. And the one option is in wherever it's in Pennsylvania and it costs $35,000 a year and their parents have no money to give them. And it's like this shock to them that now they're going to go in the military. They're going to get a job. They, they just have given up now on sports because they didn't do their homework to kind of understand what the options were. So it was a, such a shock to them when they got that piece of paper put in front of them that told them what they would owe. You know, I just, I hope if nothing else, we can educate people on that. Because once you get past that, then everything you just said you apply. And now all that, it's all about fit. It's all about where can you graduate? You know what I mean? Like you give yourself some options. But if you're sitting there with a 1.8 GPA, you are not giving yourself any options. And it doesn't matter if you set the school record for whatever. You know, it just doesn't matter. So uh, the last two questions I got with this group really is, uh, two other groups of, of people I want you to give advice to. One is high school coaches. I know you don't work in your exact role. You may not work with a ton of high school coaches, but you do see the stuff come through and you've been a high school coach and you know. So what is something a high school coach, and think all sports, not just football. What are some things a high school coach can do to help his kids or her kids? You know, I think – I think a lot of them do right early on. They talk about grades. They talk about character. They do that stuff right. I think where maybe some people miss the boat is kind of goals that are available to them. Like they don't, I think sometimes people downplay the going and competing in NAI or division three, because somehow they think that it's a, uh, you know, just a, uh, it's not going to be competitive. It's not going to be what they think it's going to be. And it, they don't even take the chance to go, you know, someplace 15 minutes down the road from them to watch a game, you know, and occasionally that's starting to pick up where I see, you know, I see players from, you know, from Pickens down at Reinhardt at games all the time watching them play. And I think they come out with a different perspective when they're like, okay, well, hold on a minute. Maybe, you know, I'm not going to walk in there and play right away. You know, I think for coaches, taking that time early on to, to say, hey, look, there are a lot of options. There are hundreds and hundreds of schools. And if you have good grades, you can get academic money. And when you get on campus, just because somebody gives you $5,000 for athletic money doesn't mean you get $5,000 the whole time you're there. If you go out and you do what you're supposed to, you think about like a job, you can get a raise. Hey, I'm, I'm putting out. I'm doing what I'm supposed to. I wasn't supposed to start here, and all of a sudden I'm starting. Now coach is going to pay me some more money because mm -hmm. I'm more valuable. So I think just, just laying out there that there's something more than Division One, even mm -hmm. though that's what everybody's goal is, and that's great. That's, that's, that's what motivates you. I just like I said before, I don't know anybody personally other than Shannon Brooks who's, who's on a Division One team or played in a Division One team, you know? Yeah, it's, um, it's, well, the, you know, the percentages speak for themselves. It's about one out of every 100 uh, play anything at Division I, and you got to figure, oh, well, there's 100 kids on my team. No, 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 because at St. Thomas Aquinas, they got 25 of them. So that means there's 25 groups of 100 with zero. So, you know, there's some of these, it, it, but about 1% of the kids play Division One. about 5% play somewhere. Um, and – Consider it an honor that a school is interested in because of those numbers. I mean, if you're in the top 5% of your SAT score, top 5% of, you know, anything, you top 5% of throwing a Frisbee, that's pretty impressive. But sometimes people are in that top 5% of college athletics, you know, where they're, they're right on the cusp of a place like Reinhardt or Barry or, you know, wherever. 
and they they act like that's kind of almost to some degree beneath them. That that is discouraging. I think I'm probably as guilty as anybody of not always being great at educating the players and the parents on exactly what their options are. I think that's a hard conversation to have with a kid that's a 10th grader and 11th grader, and you don't want to shatter their dreams. You definitely don't want to be wrong. You hope they all go to Georgia. But I do think there is some obligation on the high school coaches to to kind of steer kids where they can go, you know. Um, what about college coaches? I'm, ex I'm excited to hear you. I don't get to ask many people this because you're – I ask the high school coach sometimes what advice they would have for the college coach. How can they help them? But what advice do you have for college coaches on how they can help their team in recruiting and things like that? Yeah, so I, I thought about this. I've been thinking about this for a couple of days now and chewing on this because – I don't season, want to set you up for failure here. Now, don't yeah, say anything. I appreciate that. Yourself in trouble. Yeah, I appreciate that. No, it, it, no, I mean, it, those folks down there know by now. I'm brutally honest. Um, <laughs> you know, I think what, where I see college coaches screw up more than anything, and it, it's kind of the, the exact same thing we were just talking about, is – they they fail to go out and explore what's available to them in schools where maybe they think that there aren't players for them to have there. Mm -hmm. That's right. And everybody has got players. I don't care who it is. Somebody's got a player. And I think a lot of – and I get it. It's a numbers game. If I go to Gwinnett County, I can go, you know, in, in two or three hours, I can see 15 schools. But, you know, there are a lot of good players north of where we are right now. That, that those guys can play and those girls can play. And I think sometimes college coaches fail to um, develop relationships enough with everybody in their area that they're trying to recruit. Because in, in my mind, or just my way of thinking about it, if, if, you know, I'll use a different school, if Towns County has, you know, they let's say they don't have a player any year that I can use, but the one year they do have a player – I want to have a chance to get that player because I've, I've gone and I've took the chance to see that coach or call that coach or visit them. Maybe it's just one time a year. And every time I go, they say, I, we don't have anybody for you, coach. But that one time they do, I want to have a chance to get them. And I think sometimes college coaches, they get siloed and they, they, they get stuck in going to the places they always get players. And I get it, you only have so much time. But it's a relationship thing. And, and you know, and it's – to me, that says a lot when when coaches take the time to build that relationship with head coaches and come through and see them, and and I know it means a lot to those to those high school yeah, coaches. See those guys come through. Yeah, and, and you know, my advice to the college coaches would change based on the level, because I think at the higher level we miss on less kids than we ever have. I, I don't think it's when we were first coaching they would recruit these kids that weren't that good and they'd go to Clemson or Georgia and they wouldn't make it. You don't see near as many of those. Uh, the, we, we, have, we have a good handle on who can play and who can't. And for the most part, the best athletes go to the big schools. I think, and so I, I think with those, with those levels, I think there's an element of maybe relationship building that they could do better. I think at the level you're talking about, I think they miss on a lot of kids, to be honest. I think that for what you're saying, I think there's kids out there. And I think Reinhardt, actually, by the way, I'm not talking about them. I think Reinhardt football, for example, one of the reasons they've gotten so good is they they hit on some kids, you know, that they they didn't miss on some. And I think sometimes it's easy to be, for lack of a better word, lazy and just recruit who everybody else is recruiting. Uh, and I think sometimes you can kind of think outside the box and get some people. And I'm even thinking in sports like wrestling and girls basketball, and I'm not just talking about football. I'm talking about everywhere. There, There's this one player that's really just tough, physical, hard-nosed, whatever, and, and, I, and you wouldn't know if, you know, because the team's just okay. Yeah, but if you assemble all those people to one team and they stay all four years, because wouldn't you say – one of the biggest attributes for a college coach is identifying the people who plan on being there four years from now. Yes. Because that's hard. That's a hard thing to pick. The people who really have the perseverance to stay because you recruit these studs and if they quit after a year, it really didn't help your program that much. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think there's some, they could do their homework a little more probably 
on some of the outside the box kids. I didn't love it when the small colleges came around and all they wanted to ask me about was who else offered them. You know, I mean, what did it matter who else offered them? Uh, but at the big schools, I kind of get that. But the smaller school, you know, I mean, you evaluate them and you like them or you don't, you know, and, and I could live with that either way. But, um, is there any other, let me ask you this last question. I'll get you out in your role. I'm going to change gears. So you're the program coordinator for uh, college programs, sports programs, sports studies is the bachelor program. You guys have your graduate study uh, class is sports administration and leadership. So we got to get you on another time to talk more about this, but talk to the coaches or anybody aspiring to be a head coach, anybody aspiring to be an AD. What's some key fundamentals that you all would look for in like sports leadership, sports administration? Ooh, now you threw me a curveball. Put right you on the spot there. Yeah. But uh, I didn't give you that one. But well, what I'm asking is you aspire, you know how many people aspire to be a head coach. You, you've been in this world, you know that. What's one or two things that you say, okay, the ones I've seen that are good can do these things. These are things we really try to harp on as in a sports administrator or a sports leader. Yeah, so so I spend more time when, when teaching class about all the other stuff you do in coaching other than what's between the lines. Mm -hmm. Because that's the stuff that people don't get. It's the stuff I didn't get when I, when I got thrown into a head coach role the first time. Mm -hmm. Budgeting, um, you know, how to deal with parents, how to um, – how to be a leader, how to like see where, where you, where a program is now and where it's, where you want it to go and how to get the right people together to make that happen. I mean, I mean, you've harped on it to me before. It just, it, 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 you know, the one year I'm real bad about, Hey, it's, you know, it's my program against the world kind of deal, you know, and that's the total wrong way to do it. It's, it's the complete wrong way to do it. it, it it's, You've got to figure out the good people are organized and they have it laid out a lot like you do where they know what they should be doing all times of the year. Mm -hmm. Like the, that's, that's, it's, I tell kids all the time, the X's and O's stuff will take care of itself. Like you'll figure out what your system is you like and how that works and you'll hire good coaches to help you. You can't, you can't learn how to be organized like that. Like that's something you have to start on early of, Hey, I mean, it could be anything. I mean, as much as keeping up with physicals, keeping up with bus requests, sending stuff into the GHSA like it's supposed to be like, that's the stuff. If you want to be a good head coach, I think if you want to win, it's, you have to be able to do it all. You have to be a complete person. And, and that's, that's what we, we try to teach. You know, we, we try to, to explore all that stuff other than the X's and O's, even though I would love just to sit there and talk about the X's and O's in mm -hmm. class all day long. Ultimately, that's not what's, what bites them in the rear end is they, they, they run out of money. They can't raise enough money. They right. don't, you know, and so that to me, that's, that's the stuff you're talking about and, and, and that you're putting out there right now. That's the stuff that people have to do if they want to be, I think, a top-notch AD principal head coach that's the stuff right well obviously I'm biased but that's what I think that uh one of the reasons we're putting this stuff out there is and you know me so you know it's not about uh that I don't want to talk about uh the x and o part of football or basketball I love talking about that part of it I don't think that's what won us the game people want to come around and ask about buck sweep or getting an empty and throwing the ball and I I mean, it was great. It was fine. It, it all works. And the kids execute. What won was the culture and uh, having a plan for everything, including these kind of 10 courses we teach, including this one, of trying to have a plan to get your kids on to the next level. So, and be realistic, be honest with folks, be consistent, you know, be organized, all those things. Um, well, I really appreciate you joining me. Uh, I appreciate all you've done helping me over the years. And, uh, add this one to the list too one more thing but i do think your perspective will be very helpful to some people out there that um needed to hear that part the academic piece and all that so i appreciate it yeah that was awesome i appreciate it bud yeah man take care